Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is George and I'm here with Josh Rivera. I am an actor and entrepreneur and life learner. And Josh is also an entrepreneur, a life learner. We met through in the personal develop development arena. And Josh is a very successful entrepreneur. He's taken his business from zero to 1.5. I keep saying 1.5. If I say it wrong, Josh, just, just go ahead and correct me. Uh, 1.5 million in within about a year span. And he started from scratch. Today, what we're going to be talking about, we're going to be talking about success and what success means to you and how to move forward with success. Because the reason why I'm talking to, to him about success and interviewing him about success, because I believe success is cross contextual. And when you take a formula and you take that formula and transplant it into another area of your life where you want to use that formula to create success, you, you can actually create success and you have something that you can use to create success. So with that said, welcome, Josh. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for actually agreeing to this interview. It was just an spur in the moment thing and you said yes, and I, I thank you for that. So my first question for you would be, what is your meaning for success? And before you answer that, if you would, would like to add anything about yourself that I have not said, please do that, do that and then just go right into answering the question. I'm a father of six children, three are grown and three are at home. I'm married for 20, I'm almost embarrassed to say I forgot, but about 26 years. <laughs> I'll um, let your wife see this. <laughs> 26 years. And I'm a speaker, a trainer, a coach in NLP and in um, mental emotion release and hypnosis. I am an entrepreneur. I've been an entrepreneur since I could last remember. In fact, my first experience of entrepreneurship, and I say it's my first because it's the one that I love to go back to and reflect on as the beginning, was when I came home at the age of 10, 9 or 10 from the store with you know, a, 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 those small paper bags and some, some gumballs in it, and I had things folded up. And I would tell my mom, again, I was like 10 years old, to my mom, hey, hey, I'm gonna start my store with this. And I would tell her that I was gonna start my store with, with that little bag of candies and the gumballs, the folded bag. And I go back to that moment like, wow, so that, that could have been the beginning. You know, for me, that was the beginning of that spark. The best way I can describe it to me, knowing what I know now, having experienced what I've experienced, is success is the progressive realization of a worthy ideal. Right. Let me explain that a little bit. A progressive realization of a worthy ideal. For me, success is, is also a feeling, a feeling of accomplishment, of a feeling of happiness, of, of, a feeling of joy, that I am doing what I want to do with whoever I want to do it, when I want to do it. That's another definition of success. Doing whatever you want with whomever you want, whenever you want. And there's different reasons, the different definitions of success. For me, it's that's what it is in a nutshell at the core. Now, I've gotten successes in many areas of my life, specifically in business. I didn't just fall into being successful in what I'm doing. You don't just fall into success. For me, I know now that what I was doing then is I was applying the laws, the principles of the law of success, you know, doing more than what's expected, being the best version of yourself, you know, always stretching yourself having a clear vision of what you want for your life, taking that vision from your mind, which many people have a vision from their minds and crystallizing it, right? Not just thinking about it. Yeah, I'm going to do something to do that. Yeah, I want to do this, but crystallizing that vision in form of writing and then creating whether it's a, it's a definite major purpose statement, which is a formula that they can grow rich or whether it's just a, an incantation and always embodying it, saying what you want at all times in a highly, highly emotionalized state. So I've applied those as I built my business because initially I began doing, I can go back, I was a drug counselor for about 12 plus years and kind of tired of the bureaucracy. And so I began entrepreneur, began opening up my store and do a bunch of other things. So it was putting in writing what I wanted because you can't really hit a target you can't see, right? So not just taking out what was in my head, putting it in writing and crystallizing it, as I said earlier, putting it in writing, crystallizing it, and then memorizing it, then embodying it. Because the mind, a lot of people don't understand the power they have in their mind, George. Like the mm -hmm. mind is very, very powerful. Okay. 
you, I mean, you touched upon your journey a little bit, saying that, you know, you started off as a kid and you coming home with the bag of candy and telling your mom that you want to, you want to sell that. After that, I, I would say that the seed was already planted in your mind. But when was the f actual first time that you actually took your first journey into being an entrepreneur? Oh wow! Well, there, well, there were many, there were many, there were many moments and breaks in between. Um, the first one I would say I began it when I began to clean car windshields at the age of eleven. Clean, mm -hmm. clean car windshields at the actual stoplights. Eleven years old in the hot sun. I had a bucket full of water. I had one of those squeegees, and I was hustling. I was cleaning car windshields. I was literally making thirty bucks a day. Wow. This, this is back in the early eighties, which for some at least people in my environment was a lot of money. I remember mm -hmm. coming home excited. I made 30 bucks. I mean, they were all in quarters, right? Quarters and dimes and nickels and pennies. But it's 30 bucks is 30 bucks, right? I mean, 30 exactly. so, so I brought them home. I remember giving my mom 20 bucks to buy food for the house and me keeping 10. And I was, I was a kid. So what I do with my money? I went and bought candy and I went and played video games. Because mm -hmm. right? I was a kid. I spent ten dollars playing video games and, and, and buying candy, and I and gave pretty much for my monster buy food for my house. See, because we were raised extremely poor. You know, yeah. we were it, there were three of us: my brother, my sister, and myself. Literally in that order, I was the youngest of all three, and my father was never around. My father was a chronic drug user, IV drug user, and career criminal. He was always locked up, and he was never in the house. And we were actually living in the in Puerto Rico, and my mother depended on government assistance, and and she had a limited education so that was a challenge all in itself and so we had to literally do something to survive so that's what i did you know that was the beginning of my entrepreneurship if that you know if that makes any sense so would you say that it came out of necessity saying hey i need to make sure that something happens so it was the part would you would say the environment created that but I, I wouldn't just say it's just the environment because I mean, I would assume the environment that you lived in wasn't, I mean, because I grew up in, in a neighborhood where it wasn't really, you know, a good neighborhood to grow up in. And, you know, it was an easy way for us. Like you said, your father was an, a chronic drug user. It was easy for us to go into either you selling drugs or you're using drugs. Um, that's the neighborhood I grew up in. So uh, would you say it was part of necessity because of where you were, but also what was the, what's the other factor that you would say that it is? Because I mean, obviously you didn't choose to sell drugs or use drugs. Correct. Well, here's the funny thing. A lot was happening and not to get too deep, deep into it in terms of psychology, but I would say, because we can go like really deep with this. I, I, I would say that my biggest, like, it, was, it was the experience of lack. Okay. Of lack, they kind of move me, but not only that, because the environment definitely shapes you. But there are other factors within the environment that a lot of folks don't really take into account, and that is suggestion, the power of suggestion. So, for example, my father was a chronic drug user, but and my mother, my mother sought refuge with my grandmother, and I had a bunch of uncles and a bunch of aunts still living in that house, and it was a crazy mess there. But here's a funny thing. I was hearing two, two narratives of who my father was. One narrative was, your father's a drug user, your father's a loser, you know, he's a problem maker, he's troublemaker, whatever. And the other narrative was, your father's an entrepreneur. Mm. Your father builds. What's your, everything your father touches turns to gold. Your father is entrepreneur and blah, 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 blah. So there's two narratives. Um, they were constantly being fed in my mind. And like you said, I, I had options. I could either go down the route of using drugs or selling drugs or being part of the environment, which is what everybody was doing, actually. Or I can, you know, do something different. And I chose something different, which was to kind of, you know, and of course, necessity is the mother of invention. So I found that hustle and I began to clean car windshields and bring food for my, house, for my mom because something was driving me. You know what I mean? And I also believe it was, it was the desire to have my mom to be proud of me. Nice. So I see that you've answered a couple of my questions. Like one would be, what's the driving force? And, you know, I guess making sure that you got something from your mom to be proud of you was, was part of the drive, driving force. Now, another question that I have is you've gone through several different businesses. I mean, you've told me about a number of the businesses. I'm not going to mention all of, all of them, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to mention the one that you are currently in, 
which is and then the one that you're actually moving into which the first one the one that you're in right now is diabetic supplies and you found that and you're able to take the, you know a diabetic product and actually get a what a thousand percent return on it and you've, you've been able to be able to do that but it, you know the thing is that from every story that you've told me about certain business that you've been in there's always there this one key factor that i see is that one thing where you're able to take whatever it is and flip it over into a point where you can actually turn it into a success and that's a, a something that's constant in your life so for me i have to look at that and say what's the pattern here so can you tell me what the pattern is? What, what's, the, what's the one, if you looked at it, what's the one congruent thing that seems to reoccur in, in every single one of these businesses that you've been in? Man, I wish I could say it was one thing, but if I had to say it was one thing, it would be the consistent application of the 50, 50th law. Hmm. So Robert Greene has a book called The 48 Laws of Power, and he wrote a book with 50 Cent called The 50th Law, where he goes into 50 Cent's life Mm -hmm. his challenges, his trauma, his experiences, and what he transmuted those things into. So for me, applying the 50th law is understanding that my past doesn't have to be something that you can say, oh, you know, because of this happened, I'm not successful. Because in my family, there was nobody who really graduated from high school. Mind you, I was the first who actually got a GED in my high school. Because yeah. my mom had a, had a fourth grade education and my brother and sister didn't really go to school. Uh, my father, obviously, you know, that's another story. And nobody around really believed in education. So there wasn't a role model for that. So to answer the question, applying the 50th law, because every single person has some kind of experience, whether it's traumatic or not, but something that they reflect, reflect back to and say, wow, because of this, I wasn't able to do that. And the beauty of it is that I'm able to apply the 50th law. I didn't know I was doing that then. I know I'm doing it now, which is, which is using my past experiences, the trauma, the setbacks, the, the regret, the pain as my strength, something that fuels me and moves me forward. In fact, for me, that would be the essence of being able to turn fear into power. Nice, nice. To this day, apply it. Even now, even now, I'm like, ah, bring it on, right? Okay. Even now. So let me ask you another question to uh, follow up on that is, when was the moment that you knew that you were gonna be successful? Cause you, you gotta look at it. I mean, you were in an environment where, you know, there's drugs being, you know, drugs are part of it. You know, people are using, people are selling. It, it's something that, it's, it's something that can suck you in. And next thing you know, and we know the road to that is that it can lead to death or, or jail. And you, were able to say, hey, you know what? I'm not going to take either one of these paths. And um, there's a third choice here. Like, I mean, and I always believe that whenever you have three options, you actually have a choice. When you have one or two, it's actually an ultimatum. And you found the third one. And usually people don't find the third one. And you find what the third one is. And then you actually took action on them. When was that moment that you decided to say, hey, this is it. This is how I'm going to become successful. Wow, that's it's 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 a challenge to to be able to remember and maybe even identify that moment. It really is a challenge because so much has happened, and it's been so long that it's like a mesh. Um, but I can tell you exactly what were the ingredients that led me to really be successful. And one of them is, you know, I think I shared with you when I was um, seventeen. I got locked up. You know, seventeen. When I was locked up, I've actually something happened. You know, call it grades, call it the universe, call it God. Something happened where I got a mentor. I think I shared with you when I was locked up. And he began to feed, to, to, he saw me as a young kid getting in trouble, getting into fights. And it just so happened we were in the same unit. And he said, you know what? Um, he didn't say it, but that's what happened. He ended up instructing me on life. You know, he's a, he's a gentleman who was a Muslim. And he began to instruct me on life and the mind, how to move forward and you know, how to understand I'm destined for more. And he kept saying, you're destined for more, you're destined for more. That was like an overall theme in the, in the month and a half that we, he was mentoring me when I was, you know, locked up, which is interesting because I go back in, in complete gratitude of that. So, so, so many things have happened. I made a decision when I was locked up. I got so much pain where my family wasn't around. I had nobody, I had no money for commissary. So, so much happened that I was in the right moment at the right time. And I got the right information from that gentleman 
His name was Floyd. And when I got out of jail, I, before I got out of jail, I made a decision. I will not come back here ever again. My life will not be like this. Because when I was in jail, there are many guys that, that, that I've connected with, and they were career criminals. You got guys been 15 years, guys been locked up. He's been back for like the seventh time, and this guy was a chronic I'm a drug, drug user. So everybody around me, they were older, and they had a history of being always locked up. And I'm like, hell to the no. This is not going to be my life. Mm. So when I got out, I immediately began, and I began working, uh, you know, after doing odd jobs here and there, I began working in the drug program as a drug counselor. And then from there, 12 and a half years there, I, be, I became an entrepreneur. But to answer your question in entirety, I really don't remember the exact time, but I can tell you the formula. Okay. All right. So it, it, let me ask you, because, because of where we are now today, you know, say with the crisis and everything, if you were to hit the reset button, of, you know, if coronavirus mm. is here, and I mean, I know that you have a business that's not only surviving, but it's thriving. And you, I mean, you actually shared with me that you've made more money during the coronavirus crisis than you've made in the past. And I'm like, whoa, that's, I mean, that's a quality problem to have, I guess. Now, with that said is, if you were to hit the reset button and if you were to lose it all today, what would you do to get it all back? I mean, not what would you do, but I mean, how would you go about getting it back? Well, that's a great question because a lot of people, that is actually, they believe and they feel that is actually their situation. Mm -hmm. A lot of folks living hand to mouth, check by paycheck, and they have family, they got kids, you know, they got wives or husbands or, or even mom and dads they're supporting. So it's a lot of folks that could actually be the actual case based on how they feel and the meaning they're giving it. I do understand the most important thing of all this is, under, is knowing thyself, like understanding why you do what you do why you do it, how you do it, and when you do it, because it's a pattern. The Bible, again, I'm not religious, but the Bible says, in all you're getting, get understanding. And the way I interpret that is understand yourself, right? Because this right here, this coronavirus situation, it's simply, and I'm not underestimating it, but it's simply a moment in time, right? Maybe even, it's going to be a footnote in people's lives, right? It's not your life. This is not how it's always going to be. And the best way to, to understand how it's not, it's not how it's always going to be is because it's not how it's, how it's always been. You get what I'm saying? There's, there's a before and there's always an after. So for me, it's understanding how, how, what's happening. Like taking this moment in time, for example, if I would go back when I was 20, if I was go back when I was 20 years old, I, in the beginning of anything, the beginning of my journey, entrepreneurial journey, I would tell myself, brother, understand how you think understand how your thoughts play into this how your feelings play into this understand how your how everything you do plays into the decisions you make because a lot of folks don't understand we mostly make decisions based on how we feel like for example if i feel excited inspired and and, and motivated i'm going to do something i'm going to move forward in whatever it may be even, even if it's challenging and scary or frightful i'm still going to move forward in it but if I'm depressed and I'm tired and I'm frustrated and I want to just relax and I want to just take some, some time for myself, it's a different energy you're coming from. So it would be to understand that whole process and how to take it and how to be able to get yourself in an empowering state to make a decision. So you're saying that what you would do, the first thing you would focus on is understanding how you're interpreting everything. Absolutely, because that's the whole, that's the beginning of everything. Because like I said earlier, where do, you, where do our emotions come from? See, a lot of folks don't understand where do, or even think about where do my emotions come from? And I would dare say they come from your beliefs and your values, mm. right? Think about this for a moment. Two people can walk into a store and something could pop off or happen in the store and they could, they could give it a different meaning for themselves. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is based on their beliefs and their values, what they believe of who they are, what life is about, you know, what, what is the intention or the meaning of experiences, right? And their values, what do they value, you know, also plays into that. So, so, so what you're saying is you're going to focus on how you're interpreting things and then focus on the meaning that you give it, because that's going to basically be an empowering meaning that you're, you're I, I'm assuming that that's what you would choose an empowering meaning so you can move forward. Absolutely. Okay. So uh, with that said, I don't believe that success is something that happens, you know, like that. It's something that it, it's incremental steps that you take. With that said, is, is there a daily ritual that you do? Is there something that you do that actually gets you 
to stay and condition this the success in you. Yeah, yeah. Let let me say this. I I, I heard a quote recently, like a couple months ago, that says something along the lines that success and failure are not these catastrophic catastrophic momentary events, right in the moment. They are things that have the, 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 the little things that accumulate that mm -hmm. lead you to success or failure, which is very powerful. Because I was like, you know what? That's true. A lot of us think that failure is like, oh, everything came crashing down. But the truth is, there are little things that we either do, did, or did not do that led to that. So go into the morning, the, the rituals. Yes, I absolutely do. I've learned a long time ago, which if you would ask me, what was the one thing, Josh, that led you to success in that specific business? I would say I fully, actually, no, I, I didn't really understand it, but in faith, I watched somebody do it and I kind of kind of made sense and I began to write out a vision for my business mm -hmm. and I began to constantly create a create a ritual around embodying that vision which is next level stuff but yeah, yeah. I created a ritual so I can embody that vision I, I took my thought crystallized it put it in writing and created a ritual to embody it and remind myself every day because another quote says that we need reminding as much as we need educating so i remind myself what my mission is what my vision is from for my business for my life and i kept reaffirming it so to this day six years later i still do it mm. like i literally to this day six years later i still do it the only difference is that now i do it at such a more powerful level at a okay. deeper level of understanding because now i have the experience Nice. nice. The past experience of it working, I fully believe it. So I have the uh, it's a high level of, of of embodying it, of practicing it. You know, it's interesting that you say that you actually wrote the vision down, because I mean, I I've heard in in the past. I mean, I've heard coming up through personal development, um, Avina. I've heard that for people that write down their vision for their life or for their business or whatever, whatever you write a vision, you actually get to create your future and that usually people that have the vision written down and, the, and they read it every day even if you're not doing it passionately like you're saying having a morning a morning incantation or however you want it, you want to call it but if you just got up in the morning and read it or you put it in your mirror and when, when you go to the bathroom and you're using the mirror in the morning you read it right there and, and that helps to get your unconscious mind to actually go out and get the, like how you say, the unconscious mind is the go-getter, go out and get that uh, success for you. So now, my other question would be, if there was a certain skill that one has to possess to, uh, for success, what would you say that is? And what would you say that is for you? What a great question. Um, that one skill for success would be there's three things that are coming up for me that's mm -hmm. why i'm like okay what should, should i present or what should i put, put, put forward but there's three things one i realized a long time ago that we're not successful by ourselves even though i believe we're all ultimately self-made and what i mean by that that we're self-made is that if i don't get up every morning to do what i need to do if i don't think the thoughts i need to think if i don't if i don't put enough effort and in, in practicing, rehearsing even the emotions I want to feel, then nobody's going to do it for me, right? You can't just get up unless you buy a turnkey business. But even if you do, you still have to show up. So we're all self-made in that sense, but we also have people that we have relationships with because nobody's success by, successful by themselves. It's True. kind of, you know, so for me, it's understanding how am I showing up in my relationships, whether it's in business, whether it's in my, 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 my marriage, whether it's my kids, whether it's in the nonprofit service that I do, or the clients that I have, how am I showing up? The one skill would be, and, and a while back, I determined that I, it's, it was super important for me to be successful because somebody always has something you want, or whether it's the insight, the information that you can learn from. So I said, I need to become a relationship specialist. Nice. And not in the sense of just being a relationship coach, knowing, knowing how, you know, people and all this stuff, but understanding who can I be? What, what can I do to bring more value to my relationships? Right? How can I, 
you know, and we discussed it a while back, what, how can I bring a better quality of energy into my relationships where people feel understood, empowered, where when they interact with me, they feel like, you know, they receive something versus something was taken from them, mm. which, which is interesting. So if, if I had a pinpoint out of all that, it would be that. It's interesting that you say that. The reason why I say that is because we know that for any business owner, there are three different personalities that you have to have. I'm, I'm focused on the business of acting. I always tell them you need three three people as part of your team. You need a you need a manager slash leader. You need the artist, and usually the artist is the actor. Or in this place, it could be if you're the one that's creating the business, you're the artist, and then and then you need the owner, who's the person that takes the, or the entrepreneur, who's the person that takes the risks. So it's funny because you say that because it's like yeah, you have to understand the three different personalities and know how to speak to them. So you have to know which one you are. With my actors, usually they're, they're the artists because they're, they're the actors. And then understand how to talk to the manager leader, understand how to talk to the entrepreneur because the entrepreneur is the one that's actually taking the risk. And when it comes to acting, is the, the entrepreneur would probably be the executive producer is the person that's actually taking the risk. So you're building that relationship with that person. Or like, for example, Robert De Niro and um, Scorsese, they, I mean, they have a beautiful relationship. And they've been able to create many, many different projects together, many successful projects together for many, many years. And it's because each one knows what the other one does. And each one knows what the other one's responsibility is and, and know how to take, and they know how to fulfill on what they need to fulfill. Because the artist needs to be able to fulfill and create. They know that my vision is, I have to create the vision, create the product. The entrepreneur is the one that's taking the risk saying, okay, how are we gonna make sure that this makes money? And then the, the manager leader is the one that, basically takes care of everything make sure that the, there's a system in place that 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 i mean they manage the system that the entrepreneur puts in so it, it's very very interesting that, that you say that and I, I agree with you you can't you can't make it without a team now with that said what is it one thing that you want the people that are watching this right now to get from this conversation and that's the million dollar question right or i should say the ten million dollar question and let me say it this way you can't hit a target you can't see. That's just the way it is. You can't do that. What a lot of people don't understand is that in order to create a, a, a life that you don't currently have, you have to create a vision for that life. And then you got to do whatever it takes to crystallize that vision. And there's many ways to do that, to crystallize that vision. But I, that I mean taking it from your mind, putting it in writing, and because you crystallize it. And crystallized thought motivates action. And then, as I said earlier, we need, sometimes we need reminding as much as we need, we need educating, having it some, somewhere written, whether it's on your bathroom window, I mean, your bathroom uh, mirror, or whether it's next to your bedside or something, I, I would recommend you getting up in the morning and that's the first thing you read before going to bed, the last thing you read. And the best example of that would be Jim Carrey. Mm. Jim Carrey had... And he, the story is, on, is, is online. I'm sure most of you guys have, have seen it and heard it where he has had a check, a blank check, right? Or a check, not a blank check, but a check that said $10 million for services rendered. Mm -hmm. And he had that check folded in his wallet. And, and this is before he was, was who he became. And he kept, had that check ever so present in his wallet. So when he finally made the $10 million for Dumb and Dumber, which we talked about as well, I made mean, $10 million for Dumb and Dumber, it's really inspiring because that check served as an anchor, if you will, right? As an anchor or a trigger to remind himself, this is who you're going to be. This is who you're meant to be. This is who you're destined to be. For me, I have something called a definite major purpose statement, which is my vision crystallized in that paper. Now, there's another quote that I want to share from Susan something. I forgot her name. But the quote goes something like this. We set young leaders up for failure when we encourage them to dream before they consider who they need to be. Wow. Powerful. Because you can want all you want and have a vision, but if you're not that person or we don't work hard in becoming that person, and when I say that person, I mean, how does that person think? For example, if somebody wants to be an actor and want to get success either in TV roles or in movies, think about, Think about that version of you, which is very beautiful. Think about yourself in that role, doing those things, living that life, and ask yourself, 
How does that person think? What are the emotions does that person live continuously? What are the conversations that that person engages in? What are the people that that person has relationships with, the quality of people? What are the words they use? How do they think? How do they feel? So it's very important to tap into, not get into meta metaphysics now, but to tap into in that future version of you, the consciousness of that future version of you, and begin to live and make decisions based on who you want to be versus who you have been. So I just want to share, I mean, you talk about quotes and everything like that. I learned something interesting because, I mean, we, we always talk about acronyms and things like that. And everyone knows the acronym for fine. And I mean, there's so many different acronyms. I mean, uh, what's the other one? Fear, fake evidence appearing, appearing real. And I just learned one for the word poor. It mm -hmm. says, um, passing opportunity. Uh, wait, wait a minute. I think I wrote it down. Let me just make sure. I just want to make sure I say it right because I just learned it. So I want to say, yeah. Passing over opportunity repeatedly. Yep. And I was like, wow, that's interesting. You got job just over bro or broke all the time. But then I was like, I got to think about it. It's like, yeah, if someone is living in a state where, you know, we, we could consider poor, it could mean that they've been passing up on opportunity for a while now. And with that said, what opportunities do you see happening right now in the COVID-19 era? Wow. I believe there's opportunities in every, every industry. Like seriously. Now, granted, some things, I mean, we're not gonna actually have business as usual. Things are changing, right? And which is, which is actually a good thing because we should be changing and evolving. Um, and after the great, history shows after the Great Depression, more millionaires were made at that moment than compared to anywhere or any time in the history of the world. So. There's definitely opportunities out there. And I think a poor mindset, a poor mindset, a poor, which is great, uh, um, passing over opportunities repeatedly, that stuff happens unconsciously. A lot of folks don't know they're doing that. What's happening in their mind, and this is going back to knowing thyself and all you're getting, getting understanding of how, you, how, when, and how you do what you do, how, when, and why you do what you do. Again, like I said, it happens unconsciously because they've done that so many times that that actual practice has been outsourced to the subconscious they don't know it's actually happening so and one indicator of that is that when something comes up where they get kind of inspired well, I, I can do that but and then fear creeps in right mm -hmm. they're like oh maybe i should probably wait or oh, maybe ain't the right time or maybe i should get more information or maybe you know whatever maybe there's just so many ifs or whatever comes into people's mind so who was it that said poverty is really something in the mind was it Les Brown has a whole talk about that, how poverty is more mental than anything else. So you definitely described it. You're passing over opportunities repeatedly. And it's because it's a, a lot of it's unconscious and it's not something that you say, oh, this is happening. No, it happens all the time. It's happened so many times and now you don't really see it. All you feel is the fear, the doubt, and you say, oh, wait. And since it's what you've always done, that's what ends up being what you're always going to do because it's, it's normal. Yes, yes, definitely. I mean, that's the thing right now. I keep telling people, hey, we're in a time where there's so much opportunity getting ready to happen. There's so much opportunity happening. And they're like, what are you crazy? I mean, they're talking about we're about to go into a recession. They're talking about things are getting scarce. And what are we going to do? The sky is falling is the mentality that they have. And my thing with that is I want you to go a little deeper into this because you are, are someone that who's been able to take certain opportunities in your life and flip them over and create a success. And so how do you actually evaluate an opportunity? And the reason why I'm asking is because, I mean, I believe that if you have a, a cook and they got a recipe, like I like tiramisu, and if someone, if I have a cook that can cook, they make it really well, I want to make sure that I put them in the kitchen and go step by step with them so I know how that happens. So if we just take a moment and tell me how you take an opportunity that is presented to you or, or actually that you see and evaluate it before you step forward? Or before Great, you question. Great question. I've always, I'm always evaluating each, every, not each, every opportunity through the lens of the vision I have for my life. That's like, like if opportunity shows up and get into MLM, I, I wouldn't do it because it doesn't pertain to my definite chief aim or my biggest vision in life, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and I make sure that if I ever, if an opportunity shows up, 
that's the criteria I use. Does it pertain to my definition of fame? If it does, do I have the time to do it, right? But it's always about this life vision, right? And that's why it's important to have a life vision because it makes things a lot easier. And clarity is power because I spent a lot of my life, even while I was doing all this stuff, jumping on different things, following shiny objects and, and not really dedicating time to those shiny objects to see them grow. So it's, I have a vision for my life and if something shows, shows up, is it symbiotic with what I'm doing, mm. right? Is it symbiotic, you know? And, and I love entrepreneurs. I've seen entrepreneurs that have multiple businesses and that's because their business is symbiotic with every other business because they're, feeding, they're, they're kind of feeding off the same pool of clientele. Nice. You know what I'm saying? They pertain yeah. to each other, you know? So I, I, I love that. So that would be, is it symbiotic? Now, here's the funny thing. I have a dive bag supply business that is completely that has nothing to do with the new business that I'm building, which, which is also interesting because I built that business at a certain phase of my life. Now I'm in a different phase. So you mentioned the three gifts of service, the entrepreneur, the artist, and the manager leader. Here's another thing I realized. At one phase in my life, I was a hardcore, diehard entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. At a different phase, I was a manager leader. In a different phase, I, I tend to be more inclined to be an artist, which is interesting because how do the, which is I want to share with you, how does the, the, not to get complicated, but how does the, where you're at in your life impact those three gifts and where you, how you're showing up? Uh, what was the question again? I'm sorry. I said, I, I, my mind. I'm, I'm, the I'm question was, how do you evaluate, how do you evaluate opportunity? How do you look at an opportunity and say, this is the opportunity I'm going to step into, or I'm not going to step into this opportunity. And if someone is uh, constantly passing over opportunity repeatedly, then we have to look at, okay, can we help someone like that? Someone that's looking at this, that's, that's probably passed on some opportunities in their life to take an action and say, Hey, you know what? They're about to squeeze the trigger, pull the trigger. And as they get ready to pull the trigger, something happens that they say, no, I'm not going to do this. And then, and I'll give you an example. For me, it happened uh, a few years back. I, I was actually in Florida and I had met Joe and Joe, you know, he's a Bitcoin guy. And he's like, Hey, you know, you got to get into this thing called Bitcoin. You know what Bitcoin is? I was like, no, I don't know what Bitcoin is. And we sitting in the, in, um, I think it was a Marriott. We're in the lobby of the Marriott and we're talking. And he's like, you got to get into Bitcoin. I'm telling you, Bitcoin, you the Bitcoin. You have to get into Bitcoin. Trust me, trust me. And I'm like, okay, one, you're very eager about this. And so I'm starting to look at it and I'm like, okay, do I want to do this? You know, since so I'm like, well, okay, what's, what's Bitcoin going for right now? At the time it was going, I think for like about 400 bucks a, a pop. And I was like, okay, I was like 400 a pop. And your son's like, yeah, but I, I, then I was like, I need to look and see what this Bitcoin thing is. Cause I have no idea what it is. And he's like, well, what it is, is you give me $400 and I give you this digital code. You, I give you $400, you give me a digital code. And I'm like, wait a minute, that don't sound like a deal to me. So, you know, one long thing short is I, I knew nothing about Bitcoin. So I didn't take I didn't take that opportunity. And I kid you not, a year later from the day that we met, it was December 12th, um, no, December 2nd is when I met him and we were talking about that. And by December, the following year, Bitcoin was at about 19,000, 20,000. It was, it was close, it was hitting that mark. I called him up when it hit 17,000. I'm like, Joe, you still got that Bitcoin for 400 bucks? And he was like, he started laughing. he's like, no. You know, he's like, I told you to get in. And I'm like, I know you did. And, but I didn't know what it was. I wasn't looking at it. So, and um, I mean, I didn't beat myself up because I kind of said, hey, I didn't, I didn't know what it was and I didn't know how to proceed with this. So, you know, and one thing is, I believe, you know, you gotta have clarity in anything that you do. And I didn't have clarity, that's why I didn't take action. But then it cost me, let's say, let's round it off to 20,000. And I bought, I just, just one and said, hey, let me just buy one. So that's why I'm looking at it and saying, hey, if someone's at that point, how do they evaluate and be comfortable with, okay, I've made this decision. Because there's some people that don't, they're not comfortable with the decisions they make. Mm. It's like I was comfortable saying no to Joe. And a year later I said, oh, you know what? Well, you know, it was the, it was the wrong decision for me to make. I should have at least bought one. What's 400 bucks, you know what I'm saying? But I didn't. So what would you answer your answer be for that? Well, it, it's, it's so interesting because it goes back to knowing thyself, right? Knowing how, when, and how, how, when, and why you do what you do. And for me, one thing I've learned from, I've, I've learned is sometimes we think we're thinking, but we're really remembering. Mm. And, you know, and sometimes what we're, for example, when opportunity shows up, it could be amazing and lucrative and very, very profitable, 
but we tend to go back to the past to look for a reference and say, can I do this? Mm. To be able to determine, can I do this? Do I have what it takes? You know what I mean? Do I have the time, the money, the energy, or whatever you want to call it? There's many other reasons why, but can we do this? And if, you, if people look in the past, they most likely find moments of failure, you know, rejection and pain. They're going to be like, oh, I probably should wait. And in that, in that sense, their mind becomes a record of the past instead of a map for the future. So the way I see it is if something shows up, I really evaluate it like, again, to the vision of my life. And then if it scares me, but I know that I should do it, I ask myself, what's going on here? Because again, Joe Dispenza talks about how we've trained our body to think a certain way. And we think we're thinking, but in re- uh, with our minds, but in reality, it's our body that's saying, oh, you probably should wait. Because fear, think about fear for a moment, right? Fear is, fear is, is, is brought up is brought on by thoughts. You think of certain things that gives you fear, but you really feel fear, so it actually lives in your body. So one of the ways that I work with contracting fear is through exercising, incantations, you know, pushing myself, and in, and in, in, believe it or not, and it sounds kind of you know, black folk like what, which is actually jumping into the thing that you fear most. Mm. You know, so you can prove to your nervous system it's all in your mind. Now don't get me wrong, you know. Even though fear is imaginary, danger is real, right? Like, I, like, I mean, not to get crazy with it, but I really, I'm, I'm actually practicing consistently social distancing. You know, mm-hmm. somebody invited me to do something recently, and I was like, nah, I'm not gonna do that. It could wait, because danger is obviously real. Mm-hmm. Um, even though, so that that goes beyond the realm of fear into as something actual, which is danger. You know what I mean? The possible danger. So, to answer your question, is that I evaluate the vision of my life and I ask myself. I know I should do this. I can do this. Why am I feeling fear? Mm. You know? So. You know, as an actor, when we have to take risks and they always tell us to take a risk. I mean, I remember when I first moved to New York and I kept saying, take a risk, take a risk. And I'm like, oh, and I was, I was, I actually went and looked up the word risk in the dictionary because I was thinking to myself, I was driving me so crazy hearing take a risk. You're not taking a risk. And then I'm like, okay. So what does it mean to take a risk? And I, I believe that simply taking a risk or when it comes to being an opportunity for you to invest in something, you, you're taking a risk. That, that's what an opportunity is, really is. We call it opportunity, but you're taking a risk. And when you take a risk, what it really is, is that you embrace the fear and you actually dive into the fear. Because yes, you know, there's fear there, but on the other side of fear is success. It's what you want. You have to go through fear to get it. Yeah, because when you're on stage and you're like, okay, you know what? I'm afraid to share this part of me with, with this audience. And then you go through it. On the other side of it, you get that standing ovation. It's like, oh. And you actually feel that sense of accomplishing it and getting to where you want to get in telling the story, not as a result, but you know, telling the story. It's, it's phenomenal. And I, I think that that also pertains to when it comes to taking a risk, when it comes to business. You take a risk, not knowing what's going to happen. You're afraid of what's going to what's going to happen. You're not sure it's, it's going to it's going to turn out the way that you want it to, and you know that if you take the risk, you may be better off than where you were. It's not a guaranteed because nothing in life is guaranteed. With that said, you you were talking about the three gifts, and then you were talking about the three gifts, and you said that you actually went through the three gifts in different stages of your life. And I know that, you know, saying earlier on, you was a manager, you know, saying, and you were able to wear those hats. So I ask, because I mean, I, I believe that everyone have these three gifts, but it, not in equal portion. And there's one that's who we are at our core. And when I say, you know, you get in, in this situation where you say, hey, you know what, I have to have my team around me when I'm talking about figuring out what is your gift, you have to figure out which one is yours at your core. What would you say yours is at your core? Entrepreneur. Entrepreneur. The reason why I say that is because it's very seductive to say that I'm an artist. Mm -hmm. Um, But the truth is, it's entrepreneur because I look at my history. Mm -hmm. I'm saying what I've done. It's always been straight entrepreneurship. Okay. Okay. That's good. So um, I want to talk about one last thing, which is what I call the trinity of an entrepreneur, which is the mind, body, and spirit. And I believe that you have to balance those out in order to actually be successful in 
any industry or whatever, wherever you want to go, it's a part of um, success. It's, it, I think once you have those three well balanced, what happens is you create, you create a sphere for success. With that said, I know that you work out, you, I mean, you work out, we work out, I mean, whenever we're in the personal development arena, you and I, whenever we get together, we, we're always getting up at four or five o'clock in the morning, going out and working out, jogging, push-ups outside, and it's cold out. <laughs> Last time we did, it was really cold out, but we're doing the push-ups and working out in the park because we didn't have a gym, but we made it work. So I know you're always constantly doing that, and I know you, you're constantly reading books. You read in the morning, and you read at night before you go to bed, and you, like you said you, you also listen to audio books, so you're, you're constantly devouring stuff for your mind, and I, I mean, I do that when I get to the gym, I'm, I pop in ET because ET, he gets me going. He, when I'm working out, I can listen to ET because ET has this thing, that fire that just makes you want to go. And I work out. Now, the final component is the spirit. How are you actually nourishing your spirit? Mm, what a great question. And before, before I answer that, I want to add something that I, I read a quote. This is a quote of something that says that this ease is really a discomfort, not only of the body, but also of the spirit. And the way I nurture my, nurture my spirit is giving back in contribution. I mean, I meditate and do what I do to calm my mind and you know, do that kind of stuff. But I also, for me, I feed my spirit by contributing whether it's through mentor, mentorship, whether it's, um, you know, uh, methodically, uh, cons consistently giving back to an actual organization, which I do. I work with men. I work with men who have chronic drug addiction issues and also with the teens in the criminal justice system. That feeds my spirit. You know, that gives me, that wakes me up knowing that my life has purpose. So that's how I feed my spirit. Nice. In serving others. Okay. So I want to talk to you about one final thing. And before I go into that, I just want to say something. I mean, we, we all know that in life, there's always seasons and in business is seasons. Everything has some type of season. And right now, a lot of people would say that it's there, that we're in a winter as far as with the COVID-19 goes and, you know, and the stock market's crashing. We got businesses going, losing, you know, I mean, I think there's one business that they were saying was losing $20,000 a day. And you also have um, them saying that we're about to go into a recession. With that said, do you believe that we're in a winter or is it that we're just going through a storm? I think it's a combination of both, but I ultimately think that this is definitely a winter. And the reason why I say that is because everybody's impacted simultaneously. Mm. And with that being said, I've conditioned my nervous system to, to understand that it's really going through a storm. It will pass. Okay. So the most important thing is always remaining in a powerful state. Because from this, from a powerful state, a powerful state is a state of, I dare say, excitement. Excitement, excitement, opportunity, determination, persistence, faith, gratitude. Those are powerful, powerful states. On the flip side, a suffering state would be stress, anger, fear, doubt, a lack of confidence, feeling like I'm not good enough. So I've learned that regardless of what's happening outside of here, with anyone at any time, I can always condition my body to feel a certain way and from that powerful state is when i come up with ideas and insights and the motivation and inspiration to take action to to be able to navigate anything when you were talk about taking an opportunity and how to evaluate an opportunity one thing that hit me it was is state required i mean i would assume that it is but is state required i'm saying before you make the decision on, on whatever that opportunity is and whether it's a yes or no do you believe that you have to get into a certain state before that happens or before you oh, make the decision? Oh, absolutely. Because I really believe opportunities are around us everywhere. Mm -hmm. We're just the state we're in. We don't really see them. Um, I would say this. I think was, there was a study done in Harvard that say that we're only for, conscious of 12% of what's actually happening around us. 12%. Mm -hmm. That means that 80% we're not conscious of. doesn't mean it's not happening. It's just we're not conscious of it. You okay. know what I'm saying? So opportunities are everywhere. I'm sure there's books written on how to understand and perceive and, and realize opportunities as many ways. But being in a very powerful state, a state of positive expectancy, that's what it is. 
Right. I'm always in a state, I do my best to keep stay in a state of positive expectancy, even if it's just simply expecting insight, not even an opportunity, but an, op an insight could be an opportunity, right? It'll be an opportunity, but just to receive an insight. Um, so it definitely, state, state is, state is key because here's the funny thing. The state you're in determines the story that plays out in your head. Mm -hmm. right? And some of us have multiple stories, some stories stronger than others, but a state determines what story plays out in your head. And that story determines what strategy you're going to use, whether you're going to take action or you're going to fold, or you're going to fight, fight, flight, or freeze, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, being in a very powerful state, and it's part of my ritual every morning, conditioning that powerful state in my body, so when something shows up, I can approach that opportunity from, I can do this. I got this. I just have to focus. I just have to dedicate my time, my energy, and focus, right? If, if, if I'm in a very, if I'm in a disempowering state, I'm going to say, I'm not ready yet. I'm not good enough. I don't got time yet. You know what I mean? I didn't come from that kind of family. I don't have that education, whatever it may be. So it's, state is huge in uh, fully embracing opportunities. Nice. That's beautiful. In talking about spirit, my thing for you was, and I know you said how it's contribution for you is spirit. Is there anything else that you can touch upon that as far as like for, for the spirit? Because, you know, the thing is, I mean, yes, contribution is, is powerful, but there's some people that they haven't gotten to that point yet where they feel they can contribute. Now, when did it start for you to say, hey, you know what, I need to contribute so I can feel? Great question. It started for me when I, was, when I found myself in a place where I didn't have the pressure of money, mm -hmm. right, necessarily. Like I was like, oh, I got to pay the bills. I got to work. I got to when I found myself at a place, I began to ask myself, actually, that, and I began thinking about, okay, what kind of legacy do I want to live for my life, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, what kind of legacy do I want to leave for my kids? You know, how do I want to, you know, I, I didn't feel quite fulfilled, per se. I was happy, but I wasn't fulfilled. And I began to contribute, which kind of, that was the missing component. Now, there's another way, in addition to that, and that I link what I'm doing to a higher purpose. Mm. Which is, for me is very powerful linking what i do to a high purpose whether it's contribution whether it's being a better version of myself even embracing opportunities to show up and saying let's rock and roll let's do this that's linked to a higher purpose because it's helping me achieve my definite chief aim which pertains to my spiritual vision which is becoming the better version of myself from my family people that i serve the world the world the world in general Okay, you know? so we've talked about the COVID-19. We've talked about that this is a winter. With that said, what do you believe is the mindset that people want to take on so they can actually be able to get through this in, in a more empowered state? I, I would say for me is, a, you know, and I think I've, I've talked to you about this a couple of times, to tell them that people need to be at cause, need to be at cause, that cause uh, of what they want in their life, even though, yes, we're going through a storm and we can't, we can't, say, hey, we, we don't, we're not going to participate in, in, in what's going on right now because it's happening and it's affecting the entire world. Now, having that right mindset could help you out. Now, what, what do you believe that mindset is for, for an individual? I completely understand. And most people's mindset is, this is something new. I don't know what to do. I don't know what's going to happen to me. I don't know what's going to happen to my family if it happens to me. I don't know what's going to... And there's so many I knows and uncertainty and, and, and doubts. And that in itself tends to keep people in a very disempowered state of fear, right? And of course, what do you do when you're scared? You want to go look for more information so you can kind of kind of act that fear or undo that fear, and that brings on more fear. Yeah. So the mindset, and th th this is one thing that took me years to understand. If I can go back, I'll, I'll tell myself, work on this crap right now um, would be that the way you're thinking, the way you're feeling, the meaning you give things are all patterns. Mm. Are all patterns. There are people literally right now, there's many kinds of people with different mindsets. Some are saying, oh my God, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And some are saying, you know what? The others are saying, you know what? This is definitely a moment of opportunity. I don't know what it is yet, but I know it's there because history has shown that when something like this happens, with this recession or depression, opportunities come out of it. Millionaires come out of it. So the idea would be, the attitude would be, okay, I'm not going to pick up all these emotions from the world that are making me more scared. I'm going to think for a moment, 
Who do I want to be? How do I want to think? Who has the thought and the, the thinking pattern, the emotional pattern that I want to adopt? And make no mistake, we are creatures of habit and a habit is a pattern. So everybody you surround yourself with, they have a pattern. So if I surround myself with people who are always scared about life and talking about fear, I'm going to pick up those thinking patterns. I'm going to pick up those emotional patterns. I'm going to pick up the behavior patterns and even the language patterns because we have hung around somebody long enough. We tend to pick up some slang from them and repeat it, right? We do it so much, it becomes unconscious. That's actually called osmosis, where you're picking up things from people just by being around them. So by osmosis, you're picking up thinking, feeling, emotional patterns from people. So my thing is take control of all that by taking control of your environment, who you are surrounding yourself with, you know, who are you having conversations with, what are you feeding your mind. To this day, tons of years later, I'm feeding my mind even more than what I did in the beginning. Mm -hmm. You get what I'm saying? So yeah. I'm, practicing, I'm practicing things that, at the tenth, at the, at, you know, I've ten x. If I had ten x them, uh, <laughs> um, than what I've done in the beginning, because <laughs> I don't want to get into that. But anyway, so my, 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 my point. <laughs> anyways, my point being is that the way we are is because it's not random, right? It may have seemed random, but when it's not random. It's it's a it's it's a it's a pattern. So surrounding myself with people like George, you know what I mean? Like, you know, other people in the personal development arena that are thinking the way I think, they have these patterns that I want to adopt of certainty. So for me, the way I see it is a moment to do what you've always wanted to do that you said you didn't have time for. Hmm. Now, That's a minimum. <laughs> now, there's one thing I have to think, because as you're talking about this, I'm thinking, well, you are a masculine man and you're very centered. I believe that plays a role in, in how you operate and part of your success. And not to say that a man has to be masculine in order for him to be successful. I believe it, it plays a role in your mindset and how you, you operate, how you move. And that helps you with creating the success. Now, my question for you is how does someone that's not in that, that's not masculine, like let's say, you know, say there's, a, there's a young woman that's looking at this and she's extremely feminine. And I believe the feminine energy is extremely powerful. It's beautiful to watch. Now, with that said is how does someone in that type of energy or someone that is in this point in time in their life, they're very decisive or indecisive in, um, in what they do or making decisions. And now we're, we're in this situation right now or this, yeah, the circumstance that's been given to us, what would advice would you give to them for them to uh, take and move forward through this? The first one would be honor who they are. Honor who they are, appreciate who they are, embrace who they are, and understand that there's two kinds of energies that we all carry within us, mm -hmm. right? Masculine and feminine. Finding a way to find an intelligent balance between those energies and knowing when, when a certain type of energy can be used more to achieve your goal than the other and being able to move from them um, with these and that, that's next level stuff and I get it but that's what I do because I, I may appear centered now but this wasn't always the case I was crazy yelling screaming intense even though I can be at times and I actually am at times I show up intense but I have a more of a, a, a managed balanced a balanced a manageable balance between both so it's honor who they are and understand that there's power in both there's actually people and this, this is a great a great uh, strategy there's people out there right now, like you got Brene Brown, right? You got Brene Brown, women for, for, for femininity, Brene Brown, you got Alison Armstrong that that can tap can help you tap into for women, help you tap into the power of your feminine energy. Mm. You know, and lead with that. I, I think, man, not to get crazy with it, but I think one of the biggest challenges for people is not being able to manage those two energies at certain times. So when when certain when when a certain situation requires a more feminine, a more caring, a comforting energy, they're coming in hard body, very super masculine or, or, or the ignorant masculine, I should say. And there's times that require the, the masculine and the showing up in a passive, relaxed, you know, energy. So it's being able to balance them both, knowing which one is, which one you show up mostly in and being able to know how to manage both. That's I agree. 
I agree. And I, I would also share this, and you can tell me if you agree or not. And this is, I, I would say, being able to shift gears mm. at, as an individual, being able to, it, it, that's a very powerful, powerful tool to have when it comes to operating and moving forward and having to have success. Because especially with, with guys, I mean, and this are what, there are women also that are uh, masculine and they may not want to honor that part of them, which I suggest that you do honor it. But with, with that said is knowing which one you are at your core and then actually being able, because we're able to go from masculine to feminine and feminine to masculine at any given time. So, and knowing that what is needed at that point in time and being able to, shift it to that uh, if you're able to shift that gears because i mean I, I think about it when it comes to communication i mean there's those three levels of communications you know you got the superior inferior and equal and if i am looking at all those and if i if i'm able to switch in that those levels of communications then my communication is more effective when i'm when i'm communicating with someone and usually i, I mean i use it on mostly negotiation tactics with that said is I think shifting gears would be something that's very, very powerful. I mean, you tell me if you agree or not. I, I agree a thousand percent because think about this. We experience life through our relationships, mm. right? So, for example, you can be people are successful in business and finances and other areas, but if the relationship area is a hit, that pain tends to radiate through all the other areas because they'll probably show up at work angry or pissed off or frustrated, right? Everything is working except that, you know, they're doing whatever they can to make the significant other happy and they're just not happy, whatever, you know, and, and, the, and the story plays in their head. Um, being able to, so I, I say that because being able to shift has a lot to do with understanding why, when, and how you do what you do. Understanding thyself. There's so much to learn and so much to, 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 to grow, so many ways to grow in personal development. And it really is being the best version of yourself. And I'll, say, I'll, I'll, I'll finish with this. Napoleon Hill literally has a personal inventory in the law, in Think and Grow Rich. I think either that one or his boss success has a personal inventory. He says, take a personal inventory. In other words, how are you showing up? Mm. How are you showing up in, these, in, the, in your life? Right? And what areas need to be refined and improved? Right? And because, and that's part of the relationship mastery for me that I took on in my first, when I was growing in my journey, and I said, how can I eat, grow even further faster? And really, what area can I hit that'll, that'll impact all areas in a positive way? And it was the relationship, how to be a better person in my relationships. Yeah, definitely. So. And I agree with you. Well, Josh, I want to thank you for actually coming on, doing this interview with me. I know it's spur of the moment and you agreed, you said yes. And I'm like, yeah, let's hop on Zoom and do this. And um, I thank you because this is something I've been wanting to do because I want to, I'm part of what I want to do is I want to be able to interview successful people. I've met a lot of successful people in my life and I, I, I truly believe that success leaves clues. And uh, with you, I mean, watching you in less than a year, you know, when I met you at Leadership Academy and we were in, in what, San Diego, I believe. When I met you and watching you, the way you, you moved uh, so quickly through the environment and, and getting candidated, I was, I was so excited for you, one. And then I was like, wow, that, that, that is being laser focused, knowing what you want to do. And that's why I was like, I definitely got to interview Josh and make sure that you know what I'm saying. I, I get this on record and trying to uh, go through and dissect what's your secret to success. And I thank you and honor you for doing that. Now, with that said, I mean, please, I know you got, you're moving on from the diabetic supply onto, um, you know, personal development and being able to, you, you want to be, a, 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 I guess I want to say a juggernaut in this industry. And with that said, uh, I know you have a mastermind that's coming up. And I want you to show, share that mastermind with everyone right now, share how they can actually reach you via Instagram, Facebook, however they can reach you so they can actually be part of your mastermind. Because right now your mastermind is free for people to join, right? Currently, currently it's free, yeah. And, and the purpose of the mastermind is to bring value, certainty, insights, even breakthroughs to individuals at whatever level they're at in their personal development or in their journey at this moment in time. Right, whether they're a parent, got kids, because right now, again, I'm a parent, right? So I understand how kids are now at home, and then you got husband and wives, and kids are at home, and or maybe you know you, 
now you're spending more time than you normally do with your significant other and things can tend to pop off in those moments. So this mastermind is for quite a bit of people and it's, we're going to go into neurolinguistic programming, you know, how the mind works, the body works. We're going to go into parenting, parenting strategies for those that are parents. We're going to go into um, emotional mastery and mm-hmm. leadership skills, very deep into leadership skills and how to show up as the best version of yourself because the intent, the, the intention is twofold. One is, for us to grow, focus on improving ourselves and growing in this moment in time, which is a great moment, great opportunity for it. And to be able to be a better version of ourselves and come, once the dust is settled, as they say, and we come out of this, being in a much better position to be able to identify and take advantage of the opportunities that show up. Right? So super important. You can reach me at either Instagram, handle is Josh Rivera1130. Or on Facebook, which is Josh Rivera. You'll see my picture on Facebook. Yeah, my, 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 my actual account is public. You can definitely send me for a friend request or follow me. And I will add you to the mastermind. And that's coming up next week, which is very soon, in several days. And it's going to be very exciting. Nice. Thank you, Josh.